What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that we have two, as human beings, we have two modalities. Polarities, if you like, in terms of how we operate. I'm going to call one doing and one being. And I'm going to suggest that peak performance is what lies at the top of the triangle, meaning that peak performance is only possible when there is a genuine integration of these two. This is big bandwidth. So therefore, we need to understand what are some of the characteristics, we might even say competencies, of these two modalities. So first of all, neurologically, this will be very familiar, I'm sure, to all of you. And there is a ton of data now about the different brain hemispheres. So I'm not going to say much about that. I can point you to one or two books if you're interested. Um, more pragmatically, and here we go right into our everyday lifestyle, this part of us is very proactive. This is the part that is constantly thinking, what's the next thing I need to do? What's the next task? What's the next thing I need to fix? This is very important. This side of us is much more reflective. So this is the side of us that sits back in a more kind of empty awareness and contemplates. And one thing for sure is that every single senior leader I work with speaks of the need to make sure they have more of this. Because this is consuming. In many ways, our whole culture is consumed by this. Interest. Uh, that's, we'll come on to that later. But this is one of your great poets, actually. William Stafford once said, um, sometimes the truth depends upon a walk around the lake. I think that's a beautiful sentence. Sometimes the truth depends upon a walk around the lake. So when I work with senior leaders, one of the first things we start to look at is what is your practice around reflection? You know, some people, it's the exercise every morning, that that's the kind of reflective time. Some people meditate. Some people go for walks. But whatever it is, this is really crucial. Because if this takes over, we're in a very small bandwidth. Um, OK, so this side of us gets information in a primarily rational way. This side of us gets information in a primarily intuitive way. These are two very different, equally important faculties. Now, I want to quote something Einstein once said about this, actually in a quite remarkable statement. Einstein said, the rational mind is a faithful servant. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And we have created a society which honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. That's a really amazing statement by a scientist. 70 years ago. I think that would be 10 times more true now. So if you look at our whole education system, it totally honors the servant and almost entirely dismisses the sacred gift. These are two very different ways of perceiving the world. This one, by the way, is just as trainable as this one. I've been working the last three years with a mentor and a lot of the work we do is training this. And it's amazing what starts to open when you, when you really focus on training this side of the brain. Uh, this side of us is very analytical, which is an extraordinary 
and relatively recent human capacity. This side of us has a much more sensory, empathic connection to the world. Very different. Interestingly, I mean, there are so many experiments with left and right brain, but one particular one I was interested in reading about recently, so I had a guy on the hospital bed. They switched off his right brain. It's quite easy to do that now. So he was in pure left brain function, and he looked at his hand, and he said, whose hand is that? Who, who does that hand belong to? So meaning that this side of us apparently has very little feeling of being embodied. It's very interesting. It's also very interesting that one of the first practices of mindfulness is to really bring awareness into the body, which in itself begins to open our, our bandwidth. It's no coincidence. <laughs> This side of us, and here's a very interesting leadership tool, let's say. This side of us takes the world very literally. This side of us understands that, as well as the literal, there is a constant symbolic reality going on. And for leaders, I think this is incredibly important to understand. One of the, let's say, theatrical truths about leadership is that you are constantly on stage as a leader, meaning every single thing you do has an impact on people. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, every single thing. And it's not so much what you say sometimes, it's, it's everything else. I have a colleague at the London Business School who says, and I think he's more or less proved this, that when he walks into a new business, Within five minutes of looking at their reception area, he can tell if that business will still exist in five years' time. Just by what's the symbolic communication going on here? From the space, the atmosphere, the way you're received, all of that, that's symbolic. This is an amazingly powerful tool. And I'll just give you one quick example of it because it, I find it very strong example. It's something Mandela did once. And there's a book about it, actually, which then became a film. And the incident was the 1996 Rugby World Cup final in South Africa. Two years into his presidency, very volatile country still. South Africa make the final. They're playing New Zealand, who are the top team. So on the day of the final, huge excitement. There are 60,000 people in the stadium, millions watching from all around the world. And there's a pre-match ritual. The teams line up on the, on the playing field. And the president will walk out and go shake everyone, shake the hands. He'll walk down the line of the players. So big anticipation. At five minutes to three, President Mandela walks onto the playing field. And he is wearing the green South African rugby shirt, which was the epitome of apartheid, because no black player had ever been allowed to play for wear this shirt. And he is wearing this shirt. And the author of the book it captures it. He says, at that moment, 60,000 people went, what? What? And millions watching. And the author then says that was possibly the single most powerful communication Mandela ever made. Because in that moment, he was saying, we have to be together. That is an extraordinary example of symbolic communication. And it happens all the time in leadership. And it's a very important lever to understand. Telling stories, of course, is as we all know, one of the best ways to communicate your point. That's also symbolic. It's not to say, all of this is not to say that one is better than the other, but it's to say that if we want a big bandwidth, we need all of this. The human cost is that this is a very 
relatively small way of experiencing life. That's the human cost, at worst. And this becomes very consuming. And all the senior leaders I work with really have to work very hard to find a balance between these two. Once this has consumed you, you start thinking stuff like, if I'm not doing something, I'm wasting time. I'm not being productive. This is a real sickness. Sorry to be blunt. This is a real sickness, and it's very important we see that. <clears throat> this is a reduction of the human being. And actually, a, ultimately, not, I was going to say tragic way, but also dangerous way. The author of the most landmark book about the brain hemispheres is a very uh, senior Oxford academic from, um, I think he's at All Souls College. And he wrote his book about two years ago, and it's an ex actually a really incredible book. It's a 500-page book of research about right and left brain. But his one point, and the book caused a lot of stir because he's an academic, which of course is more typically in this world. But his one uncompromising message throughout the book is that we are so out of balance as a civilization that unless we rebalance, our future is questioned. That's his one point. So I think this has very big implications. And it's very, your question is the key one, because when we are consumed by this, and this is the work I do over two days with a team, we meet certain barriers before the opening occurs. I'll talk about those a bit later, and when I go on to the circle. <laughs> I can also say about this, this is a very, a slightly more abstract point, but this side of our consciousness is very fixated on form. This side of our consciousness can reside much more in space. This is why meditation is such a powerful tool. Because when you practice meditation, you orientate yourself much more towards space than towards form. That may be a little abstract to understand. Um, just, yeah, just one moment. Because also, if you think about it, because I'm very interested in innovation and creativity, obviously. And if you think about what do people say, what do artists always say about the moment of creativity, they say, the idea came to me. The idea came to me. Well, an idea can only come to you if you have some space inside you. If you're filled with form, there's no room for anything new to come. You will just rearrange what you already know. Because real innovation, real deep innovation, always is something beyond what we know. That's when innovation gets really interesting. And then it brings actually a feeling of the future coming in. And when teams I work with, when we start to reach that territory, something very, very interesting happens. And one of the symptoms that were in that territory and this happened most recently when I worked for a year with a group of very senior engineers who started out you know, very much in this world, but we gradually opened the bandwidth. So one of the symptoms that you're in that territory is that, it, that people, that the team get comfortable sitting in silence. Now that's quite radical. It's simple but radical in our world. And not only silence, but you feel the silences. It's like there's, a, there's something happening in that silence. It's an imminence happening. It's not just a kind of we're bored silence, far from it. It's like a, there's an alert kind of silence. It's like the system is open. And then a very interesting level of ideas starts to come, more like a download. It feels actually like a download, you know, like when you download software. 
and it's coming onto your computer. It feels like that. And it becomes much less about who had an idea, because often after a session like that, you forget who had an idea. It's not so, an idea came, and it, it came through the whole group. Then we're operating in a, in a really interesting bandwidth. Um, because another thing, of course, to say is that this side of us much prefers reality to be known, and this side of us is much more able and actually comfortable being in the unknown. Now, I worked for 25 years in the theater, and I can tell you as any serious artist will tell you, that unless you're willing to sit in total unknown and often real confusion, there will be no real creativity. Because unknowing is the gateway to creativity. Because otherwise, it's not creativity. You're just rearranging what you already know. It's like change, often, it's just like doing that. And people say, well, that's, cha that's no. I mean, that's a certain level of change. Transformation, innovation is very different. And the gateway is always being willing to sit in this unknown receptivity. And just look at how our culture operates. We don't give space for that. I mean, when I talk to people in organizations, anyway, the, there was a, re a big research about this. People spend over 50% of their time in meetings, and over 50% of that they feel is time wasted. Not the ones that I'm speaking of. I'm very pleased to hear that. I'm sure. No, I can tell. I can tell. I'm sure they are. No, see, I, it may well be true. But I'm making a point. Yeah? Because if you look at how most meetings are run, it's blah, 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 blah a lot of the time and often unfocused, blah, blah, blah. This team of engineers I worked with for uh, actually the world's biggest defense company, they introduced of their own volition that before all important meetings, they sat together for five minutes in silence. See, something very, that's both very simple but also very radical because our culture doesn't do that. Most of our culture doesn't do that. Because then you're opening a space. And then when people talk, it's coming from a deeper level and a more interesting level. Does this make sense? There's only one thing we can genuinely control, and that is how we pay attention. And to what do we pay attention? This is like a, a muscle that needs training. And the more you train it, the more it becomes available to you. So we can't quieten our minds. It's very important that we can't do that because our minds are built to think. But we can choose how much attention we give to our mind. Because if you learn, for instance, to pay much more subtle attention to your body, then a, a space happens around your thinking. Your thinking is still can be very busy, but you're not so caught in it, is, is the answer to your question. Yeah, does that make sense?